Good evening and welcome everybody. My name is Rabbi Leah Cohen and I'm the Executive Director and Senior Chaplain here. Tonight's program is co-hosted by the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism and Joseph Slifka Center for Jewish Life at Yale. We are so pleased to see everyone here and we're looking forward to an intellectually engaging evening. Before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes to explain some house rules. First, the first part of the program will be a panel discussion, followed by the second part, which will be questions from the audience. Note cards and pencils are available for you to write down your questions. If you have a question, please write it down and hold up your card, and a staff member will come by and pick it up. <coughs> second, this is an evening of civil discourse, and we look forward to just that. And finally, we will allow for the clock to take precedent. Tonight's topic is one that can be discussed for ages, but our program will last only an hour and a half. So without further ado, let me take a moment to introduce our illustrious panel here with me. Sitting to the far right is J.M. Winter. He is the Charles J. Style Professor of History and a specialist on World War I and its impact on the 20th century. At Yale, his courses include lectures on Europe in the age of total war and on modern British history, as well as seminars on history and memory and European identities. His other interests include remembrance of war in the 20th century, such as memorial and mourning sites. European population decline, the causes and institutions of war, British popular culture in the era of the Great War, and the Armenian Genocide of 1915. Dr. Winter is the author or co-author of a dozen books and has edited or co-edited 13 books and contributed to more than 40 book chapters. He is the co-producer, co-writer, and chief historian for the PBS series, The Great War and the Shaping of the 20th Century, which won an Emmy Award, a Peabody Award, and a Producers Guild of American Award for the best television documentary in 1997. Sitting right next to him, is Jeffrey Alexander. He is the Lillian Chavison Sadin Professor of Sociology at Yale, where he teaches courses in cultural sociology and is one of the co-directors of the Center for Cultural Sociology. Dr. Alexander works in the areas of theory, culture, and politics. He has published more than 20 books and dozens of peer-reviewed articles on these subjects. An exponent of the STRONG program in cultural sociology his work focuses on the cultural codes and narratives that inform diverse areas of social life. And right next to him is Morris Samuels, the Betty Jane Anlin Professor of French and the Acting Chair of the French Department. He is also the Director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism. He specializes in the literature and culture of 19th century France and in Jewish studies. He has published articles on diverse topics, including romanticism and realism, aesthetic theory, representations of the Crimean War, and boulevard culture. He is currently working on his third book on the relationship of anti-Semitism and philo-Semitism in France, from the French Revolution to the present. And now, let me take a moment to introduce our keynote speaker. Deborah E. Lipstadt is the Dorot Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies at the TAM Institute for Jewish Studies and the Department of Religion at Emory University. Dr. Lipstadt is one of the world's leading scholars in the field of Holocaust studies. Her books include The Eichmann Trial, Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, Beyond Belief, The American Press and the Coming of the Holocaust, and History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier. Dr. Lipstadt was a historical consultant to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and helped design the section of the museum dedicated to the American response to the Holocaust. She was appointed by President Clinton to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council and has been called upon by members of the U.S. Congress to consult on political responses to Holocaust denial. Professor Lipstadt is often called upon by the media to comment on a variety of matters and has appeared on Good Morning America, NPR's Fresh Air, the BBC, Charlie Rose Show, and is a frequent contributor to a variety of newspapers and journals, including the Washington Post and the New York Times. 
In 2006, she was elected to the American Academy of Jewish Research, the oldest organization of Judaic scholars in North America. Fellows are nominated and elected by their peers and thus constitute the most distinguished and most senior scholars teaching Judaic studies at American universities today. It is my privilege now to open up to the panel several questions and then we'll take questions from the floor. So the first question that we have confronting us this evening is what has changed or what is unique about anti-Semitism today? Is it on the rise? And if so, how do we know? Uh, good evening. It's a, a pleasure being here, um, even if it's a dour topic that we've come to discuss. So I'm glad the clock will take precedence. Um, I think that, uh, well, first of all, our, our knowledge that anti-Semitism is on the rise is not just anecdotal. There have been serious studies, I know Professor Samuels will talk about some of these in a moment, uh, done, some done by the Pew Organization, done by the EU itself, um, the ADL, uh, and uh, uh, some foundations in Germany, just ones that I brought up in the last 24 hours as I was going through and checking uh, the statistics on, in the most recent statistics. And consistently, they all point to a increase in anti-Semitism an increase in anti-Semitism that was visible and that was quite uh, striking before the events of this past summer. Um, and, and one of the things that also is quite striking is that, um, yes, it's clear that when there are events you know, in the Middle East, such as the, the war in Gaza, uh, there's an uptick. In many countries, it doesn't go back to what it originally was. It goes up, it comes down, but at a higher level. And again, you see that consistently. Uh, you can't talk about a global kind of anti-Semitism that's the same in Hungary as it would be in France. Each country has its own, and, each, and within each country, there are specific area differences. So we've got to be careful about that. But at the same time, I don't think there's any doubt uh, that you're seeing um, increases in anti-Semitism. And um, maybe just to... to uh, give it a specific uh, kind of um, format. Um, what you're seeing, sometimes you're seeing pretty outrageous, outrageous and horrible things, such as the murder in the Brussels Jewish Museum, which just reopened, and I'll be in Europe in the near future, and I hope to go there. Um, or the murder in Toulouse, uh, which was 2012, right? Uh, 2012. Um, again, not related to a specific incident in, in the Middle East, or uh, uh, ostensibly related. Um, but you're also seeing a change in attitudes. One of the EU surveys was not of anti-Semitic incidents, but of Jews' perception of anti-Semitism. And in all the countries, and the most striking was France, I think it's 70%, 70% of the Jews in France yeah fear anti-Semitic incidents. So something is happening, and it's not just high-level things that make us think it's global, but something is happening, um, and happening quite seriously. Um, thank you. So a couple things on this question. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement about, first of all, what constitutes an anti-Semitic act. Is it a threat? Is it violence against people? Is it violence against property? Um, another complicating factor is that every country counts these differently. And it's important to keep in mind that most of the vast majority of incidents are not reported. Um, so it's hard to get actual statistics, and that's why if you look at all these different surveys, they're all different. But there are some general trends that I think are beyond doubt. The biggest trend is that there's an enormous increase in the 2000s, so since 2000, roughly since the start of the Second Intifada, compared to the 1990s in Europe. So in France, for instance, there are about seven times as many anti-Semitic acts after 2000 compared to the 1990s. Um, a few other statistics. So to give you a sense, so according to one of these um, organizations that's devoted to compiling statistics is the Cantor Center in Tel Aviv. That's their mm -hmm. primary purpose. So I was looking at, at, and they put out a report every year. It's available on the internet. Roughly, to give you an 
idea of the numbers that they're reporting. So of actual violent anti-Semitic acts, so actual attacks worldwide, 2012 had about 686. Um, the peak in the 2000s was in 2009, there were 1,118 acts. Um, France has by far the most um, in, uh, in, 2000, in um, 2012, they had uh, roughly double that of the next uh, country. The other countries are the UK has the next most, then Canada, then the US, then Germany. It's important to note that in most of these countries, Jews are a tiny minority. So in France, Jews are 1% of the population, but 40% of all racist violence is against Jews. Um, also another uh, from the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency, 77% of European Jews do not report threats and insults against them to the authorities. So there's a vast amount of kind of threats and insults that are not reported. And if you start to really probe what kinds of, and this is another question we can talk about later, uh, what kinds of anti-Zionist uh, comments are anti-Semitic, then that opens a whole other uh, realm of, um, of uh, forms of anti-Semitism. Um, this year is on track to be much higher. So in the first half of the year in France, which is what I study, it's roughly double compared to last year, um, for obvious reasons, I think. Um, and. Uh, one other thing I would point out is that the Anti-Defamation League in 2014 did a survey that got a lot of publicity, probably many of you heard about that, um, that showed that 26% of people worldwide hold anti-Semitic views. Um, unsurprisingly, the Middle East has the highest, 74%. On the West, in the West Bank and Gaza, it's as high as 93%. Um, but, you know, this survey was criticized by a lot of people for really focusing on traditional forms of anti-Semitism and not really getting at what scholars call the new anti-Semitism, um, which is, you know, for instance, uh, anti-Zionist in focus. And that's a, another question that we can try to talk about, what kinds of anti-Zionism uh, constitute anti-Semitism. Certainly not all do, but some do, I think. Um, so that survey didn't really probe anti-Zionism and therefore I think is sort of unreliable. The subject um, of anti-Semitism in Europe has to be seen as uh, multivocal. There are multiple uh, currents of anti-Semitic behavior and rhetoric that vary according to the uh, national and religious traditions of different uh, countries. Uh, we must admit as well that there is, alongside anti-Semitism, a degree of Islamophobia that my guess would be parallels the development of anti-Semitism. That, that the, the level of intolerance in European society for numerous groups has gone up in tandem. Uh, and I think there's a general societal and political failure uh, of assimilation and of tolerance, which we need to talk about later. Uh, but I also want to assure you that there are contradictory trends in Poland, which I visited several times over the last few months. Uh, there's, a, there's a deep philo-Semitic tendency right alongside anti-Semitic views. They're, they're contradictory, they're complex, and unfortunately they reiterate the old uh, issue that uh, Jews are not a normal population. They either cause extraordinarily positive feelings or extraordinarily negative ones. And uh, that is a, a, an issue that I think varies according to, to country. Roman Catholic cultures are different from Orthodox cultures. <clears throat> in Orthodox cultures, anti-Semitism is lower. In Orthodox traditions in the East of Europe, in Bulgaria, for instance, I was really struck by the parallel between the treatment of Bulgarian Jews during the Holocaust and the absence of an of an inflection of anti-Semitism today. There is something about long-term traditions we need to bear in mind. I'll take a bit of a different perspective on this. I mean, I, I think there clearly has been an increase of anti-Semitic actions and incidents, but I'm not convinced, I'm not an expert in this field, that there's been a rise of anti-Semitic 
values, let's say, or thinking. I think that the surveys about opinions are very untrustworthy. Um, what people can say, feel they can say in interviews, and what they can't say. I think we're in a period now where, uh, in Europe, there is um, um, a lot of the restrictions and inhibitions of the post-war Holocaust dominated period are disappearing. And what uh, about a quarter of the population has continued to feel uh, are now able to be expressed um, more openly. I think almost all, industri all industrial societies have about a 20% group who are deeply prejudiced, irrational, racist, uh, and anti-Semitic. Um, I don't know that that, I don't believe that that has increased. What I think has changed today is uh, the, uh, uh, act, the open demonstrations, political activism of extremely anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, um, entitled uh, Islamic activists in Europe, and that they have uh, often publicly been anti-Semitic as well. I think that anti-Semitic stereotypes have by now become deeply embedded in the collective consciousness of Islamic Arabs throughout the Middle East, that they've understood uh, the presence of Israel and is Israel's policies not simply in, let's say, a geopolitical, much less a historical way that might justify uh, Israel, but in an anti-Semitic manner. And these intellectual currents have been traced in terms of how did this happen, Christian missionaries in the 19th century, uh, Arab leaders' participation in Nazism in various ways, et cetera. But the framework of in which the occupation, Israel's foreign policy, and uh, it's have been understood has been in terms of generally anti-Semitic stereotypes. Um, the last thing I would say is that I do want to draw it. I, I don't believe that anti-Semitism is caused by Israel. I think it's an enduring culture structure that hasn't disappeared. Two things I'd say, though. One is that... The, there has been a dramatic lessening and diminution of anti-Semitic values among a majority of Europeans, Western Europeans and Americans, and that this is probably the most important transformation um, in Western history, and it's occurred post-Holocaust, and it's, I think, deep and will not be overturned. I think we have to keep that in mind. The other is that the term, the new anti-Semitism, emerged in the early 1970s as a way for people who defended Israel's occupation and its foreign policy uh, to say that the attacks on Israel's foreign policy were a new form of anti-Semitism. I'm introducing that because I think that's always been an issue, and that's why the term was started. Today, as Deborah applied, it is different. She's talking about actual expressions of anti-Semitism on the streets of Europe mm -hmm. and fears of it growing, but the term itself is deeply ambiguous. In, in the, it started and is still often used as if you are a passionate, venomous critic of Israel's domestic and foreign policy, that is in effect, anti-Semitic. I don't agree, because I am myself a vehement critic. I, am, I hate the occupation. I think it's deeply wrong and deeply self-destructive. Um, and I do see that sociologically as one of the factors which has triggered age-old stereotypes and has allowed the situation now to, one of the factors, to become out of control and for the lid to have been taken off the pot now in terms of public expressions of anti-Semitism in Europe, not yet here. So that leads us into our second question, which um, is 
If this is true, if we see a rise in modern anti-Semitism, however one might define it, what has shifted? What are some of the causes? And I think we started to get into that, but Deborah, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, I think some of the, a lot of those things have been said by my colleagues on the panel. Um, and I think Jeffrey's last statement was very carefully and not, uh, not surprisingly so uh, uh, said, no, because it's what I, we would expect of you. Um, and that is that uh, the events in the Middle East take the lid off of something that's already there. They don't cause it, but they take the lid, they allow certain things to be said. And I think one of the changes, and again, I, I think uh, came from you or Jeff, Jeffrey or you, Jay, um, that things are being said today that, that were taboo or were considered you couldn't say earlier. Um, and the most, I mean, it's an outrageous example, and it's one example that's repeatedly cited, and I mentioned it in my article, but it shocked so many, many people in the streets of Berlin to see, you know, signs of Jews to the gas. Um, was, was just, it was, some, some people may have thought that before, but the thought that you could say it and you could march down the street or, you know, Jews equal Nazis or, or Netanyahu equals Hitler, no matter what you think of Netanyahu, it does not equal Hitler. Um, and uh, so the, the, the change is this, this lid coming off. Um, I, I also, and this doesn't really answer your question, but we're, academics are famous for answering whatever question they want to answer. Um, I think there's something else that should be put on the table uh, because it's too easy just to focus on um, Toulouse and Brussels, which are horrible, horrible and you know frightening incidents or people being beaten up or the rabbi in Berlin who was walking with his child and had his jaw broken um, by uh, when he was attacked and because he was clearly uh, a Jew wearing a kippah and a beard, et cetera. Um, but there's something else that I think is happening that I have found very disturbing. And that's in cities as diverse as London, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, where Jews know or tell their kids, don't go there. If you're gonna go there, don't wear a kippah. Put your Magain David under your shirt, and better, you shouldn't go there. Um, and this is now I'm dealing, I, I recognize now I'm dealing anecdotally, but I've heard from many people, Americans going, now again, we're far away, we tend to get you know, worked up and, and more easily, et cetera, but, or even Europeans saying, well, we, we would go to the kosher restaurant, but now we just go and take out food and bring it home to eat or, or or we're not going to uh, the Klezmer Festival that was a week and a half ago in Regent's Park where I, where I was in, in London. And some people said, well, we're just not gonna go. We don't think it's a good time to go. And it was a gorgeous day in London, inexplicably so. Um, you know, uh, So there was no weather reason to keep people away. Um, and on some level, and this may sound strange when you're talking about murders, that is, equally disturbed, that's disturbing, equally disturbing. Um, of course, it's far, it doesn't compare to someone being murdered, but when 70 years after uh, the destruction of the European Jewish community, you have Jews frightened uh, to be full participants in society, um, that's, that's a change. Now whether, I don't think they expect they're going to be attacked by, and, 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 and Jay Winter, you, 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 you alluded to this or spoke directly to this, as did you, Jeffrey, I don't think they think they're going to be attacked by the uh, run-of-the-mill French person or, or English person on the street, that it's, it's more fear of uh, people of uh, Muslim affiliation Arab, from, Arab, or from Arab countries, however loosely you want to put it. Um, but in many countries, in a number of places, and that's one of the things that's come up about, about France, about Germany, the feeling is that you won't be protected, that the police may not take it seriously. Um, and that's why Chancellor Merkel's statement this past Sunday was so important, and President Hollande's statement in the past have been so important. But when you need the head of your country to, say a to make a statement about Jews feeling safe, something has shifted. 
something qualitative has shifted. And I think that's as important for us to address as Jews to the gas and, and murders, et cetera. Right, I think, uh, you know, as we've said, um, it's clear that events like the Gaza war uh, are trigger events. Um, and it's clear that, that they um, act as almost like gateways or that allow for, as Jeffrey said, the normalization of a certain kind of anti-Semitism. So you can start by legitimately protesting the Gaza war. And then it, you know, we saw with a lot of those manifestations this summer, they uh, slip into, you know, uh, chanting Israel are, you know, Israelis are murderers and then uh, Jews to the gas. So there clearly is a kind of, um, uh, you know, um, triggering that goes on. Another thing that I think is important to, you know, as, as Deborah said, um, you know, much of, at least in, in France, uh, which is the country with the most um, anti-Semitic violence, that, you know, I think it has to be said that most of these um, attacks are being perpetrated by people of um, you know, Muslim or Arab descent. But I think it's also important to stress that um, there are deep sociological causes for that, um, including a profound sense of disenfranchisement of those populations. Um, and they, uh, you know, and Islamophobia. So I think it's important to see anti-Semitism and Islamophobia as linked to a certain extent. Now the problem is, why do some people from those populations take out their perhaps legitimate frustrations on Jews? Um, that's, that's a real problem. And I think we saw it in the past year, um, the perfect example of that is the French comedian Dieu Donné, who uh, has really catalyzed a kind of frustration with the establishment. Um, and that, for him, includes Jews uh, now. Another factor, and I'm not an expert on this, but maybe Jeffrey is, is I think the rise of social media can't be underestimated. I think the fact that um, these issues are now debated endlessly on Facebook and Twitter um, has had a kind, another kind of uh, galvanizing um, effect. So. I still think in 1895 and in 2014, uh, anti-Semitism is the socialism of the fools. And by that I mean there are large groups of naysayers, people who are against, who simply believe that, that uh, the European Union is a banker's wrap, it's for people who have money and want more, and that there are fringe populations who are uh, treated badly. Uh, and I think it is, uh, I think, quite extraordinary that the American press, and, and the British press to a degree, uh, have neglected the fact that the vicious violence that takes place between white American police and poor blacks in this country happens between French police and North African mem members of their society. There is violence against Arab populations young men in particular, that is unlike, massively greater uh, than that which has been shown uh, against Jews. And the resentment of these populations has multiple sources. As, as Maury said, I, I'd just like you to realize that you know, very large populations voted communist for years and then communism simply evaporated. Where are they gonna go? Alarmingly, to the popular front to right-wing groups that have long histories of anti-Semitic uh, commitment. So that there are naysayers in Europe, which s seem to me to indicate some great, and I think societal failure of assimilation on the part of those in, in power to include uh, new populations. Let me just give you two instances that, that matter. Europe now, today, is registering the lowest fertility rates in its history. There are below replacement fertility levels uh, in not all, but most European countries. France is hovering, but still the German populations and the Italian population, the, the Spanish population, they never have what I would call indigenous fertility levels been as low as this. Muslim populations have family sizes much bigger, substantially bigger, and this produces tension when your kindergarten or your schoolroom changes character within a week at the beginning of the school term, le, you know, le, le grand retour, uh, I know so well, I'm 
at the end of next year when I retire, I'm taking my re retirement in Paris. So this is a palpable story for me. Uh, and there, there is something fundamental about the fear of populations who believe that they are under Muslim invasion. Now that is bound to affect the behavior of the police. It just does. And you know, if you go, if you go anywhere in Paris on a Saturday night, you'll see these CRS individuals. These are tough guys. These are the paramilitary police. Uh, you know, what would you call it? Hassling anybody who looks Muslim. Now we wouldn't tolerate that if that were Jews. If, if, if we, they tolerate, you know, they, they hassle people who wear kippot or whatever. It's there is a culture of intolerance, which, in my view, has developed a language now that is no longer naysaying communism or radical communism left, but a rejection of liberal tolerance. And I believe this subject is really a crisis of tolerance and tolerance on all levels. That, it seems to yes. me, could account for the increase in anti-Semitic incidents and beliefs and social media and so on without reference to Gaza at all. Gaza seems to me to be a shibboleth, it's a phrase, mm -hmm. and, and, and of course real anger, et cetera, attached to it, I, I have no doubt about that. But the depth of, of, uh, of my worry, and the reason why I responded very seriously to your op-ed, um, Deborah, is that it seems to me that a crisis of tolerance is something we've seen in Europe before, um, and we have to take it more seriously than it was taken the first time around. We just have to, there's no, there's, there's no question that nobody, including Angela Merkel, is going to let it be, uh, as, as it were, one of those things that happened. This is too dangerous a moment uh, in European history, which I think is radically different from this country's history because of the racial question. This is a dangerous moment, and you are absolutely right to call attention to it. Thank you. Can I just um, respond? Yes, yes. Jeffrey, do you mind if I just... No. no. Okay. Um, I think, you know, and that was one of the points I was trying to make in the op-ed. It got a little lessened because you go through this editing process, which can drive you mad, or, um, uh, but, and it's exactly, Jay's exactly the point. Um, there's a Yiddish proverb, which I won't attempt to uh, repeat um, in, in Yiddish. Uh, you know, uh, the Jew, what is it? The, the world seizes and the Jew gets the cold, you know? The, the Jew is the barometer. What, what, and that's, that was one of the points that, um, where is the outrage of the cultural, intellectual, political, artistic elites in France, in England, which I uh, know better, um, in, in various places in Western and even Central Europe? Not outrage, you know, come feel sorry for the Jews who had to be barricaded in the synagogue till the gendarmes came to release them. Not that, but the outrage and the fear about the liberal democratic society which has allowed you to flourish because this failure of liberalism, this failure of tolerance is the, what you, the anti-Semitic outbreaks are to a great extent the, the pinnacle of something much uh, equally more rotten underneath. And that's, that's the absence of what I'm seeing. I'm sorry, Jeffrey. I, I would just want to underscore something that Jay said, and I, I mentioned it, which is that the, let's say, the social, the carrier group of the new anti-Semitism are um, radical Islamic activists who are extremely disturbed about Israel, obviously. The other group are the new right, non-Arab new right groups in France and, and elsewhere. Um, the, this, this carrier group, if you want to call it that sociologically, is the most oppressed group in Europe. They are the underclass. And the, the Muslims have been uh, expanding in population and are marginalized. And throughout Europe, the radical right neo-Nazi groups are forming and getting on the ballot 10, 15, 20 percent all over Europe, every country virtually, not all neo-Nazi, but um, uh, not about, but it's not publicly about Jews, it's about 
uh, Muslims. It's about keeping these Muslims out. So you have this group who feels marginalized under fierce pressure, who turn to, who hate Europe, too, hate cosmopolitan Europe, mm -hmm. and are also turning to anti-Semitic, um, the anti-Semitic myths in their own culture, and they're a diaspora community. The other thing that I'd just say briefly is that um, I don't think that Europe has been comfortable with public expressions of Jewish culture. It hasn't embraced the kind of uh, Yiddishkeit that America has in the last 50 years. In, when I was living in Paris in the 90s, my colleague, I said, Happy New Year to him. On Rosh Hashanah, he said, Shh, we don't say that here. That's for the home. You don't, you don't have public expressions of Judaism in, in Paris. And you don't. I disagree, but yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's what I experienced, and that's what he said. So I think there's, um, this is another factor that I would try to think about sociologically. As we shift now into our final question for the group, because I want to make sure that everybody has time to ask their questions, hopefully you have your note cards and your writing questions, if you have any. If you simply hold them up, we have staff who will come and collect them, because I'm hoping that this has stimulated a lot of your own thinking. The last question is, if all of this is true, what, if anything, can we do about it? In three minutes or less. Oh, Just yeah. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do about it, Deb? Well, I think partially what we're doing right here is, is talking about it. And um, again, the, the point that I jumped in and out of turn to, to respond to Jay um, a few moments ago, um, make the point that uh, while this is frightening and worrisome, um, it's not just frightening and worrisome to Jews or to people who care about what happens to Jews, but it's frightening and worrisome on a much bigger level, that you are seeing um, a, uh, a disintegration, or deteriorate, it was too strong a term, but certainly a deterioration of something we have taken for granted, or, or we thought had reestablished itself in post-World War II uh, Europe. Uh, there are many, uh, no, some historians who talk about, when they're talking about pre-World War II Europe, talk about the so-called enlightenment, you know, because they weren't sure it was such an enlightenment given what followed. Um, and I think maybe it's, it's a question of, of something happening in Europe. Again, not that your uh, long-term, and I put it in big quotation marks, native population, because many of these people marching are native French and native German, born there, if not second generation, but um, are suddenly hating Jews. But there, there is a, uh, a discontent that is expressing itself in anti-Semitism, which is always there. As, again, as, as, was, as Jeffrey said earlier, the lid has been taken off. It's directed at Jews. But I think what I would say, and maybe this is a paltry response, um, is to uh, colleagues in Europe, uh, whether academic, whether um, artistic, uh, you know, the, the elites, the, the intellectual elites who have a much greater voice in Europe than they do in, in, in the United States, that this is something they should worry about, again, not out of good-heartedness towards Jews, but about concern for their own societies and cultures. So, you know, I, to go back to something that you said in your, uh, editorial, which was, or in your op-ed, that, you know, are we in 1939? Well, you know, no, because the main thing to underscore is that all these, the governments are, or, you know, most of these governments are firm in denouncing anti-Semitism. So unlike during the Holocaust, this is not a government-sponsored persecution. You know, as, um, as you, you know, said, the you know, Prime Minister of France has said things to attack a Jew is to attack France. I mean, he's very clear about this, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of protection, government protection, at synagogues on Rosh Hashanah. 
Um, but, you know, could these countries do more? Uh, yes, probably. But I think the danger is that it risks backfiring. And this is one of the main problems that we've been seeing, is that, you know, in a lot of these countries, including France, um, there's mandatory Holocaust education in schools. Um, it's illegal to deny the Holocaust. Um, it's, you know, uh, inciting racial hatred is a crime. And this, many people think, has backfired, actually, that people resent, certain populations resent the Holocaust uh, education in schools. Why aren't they talking about colonization as a crime, you know? So I think that this is, this is a real problem, how, how to react to this. Um, I think it's another question, um, how can we here, uh, so in the United States where um, we don't face a lot of these same issues, but there is a certain and I think growing um, problem here too uh, that we see in, especially around the Israel issue. And I think one of the things uh, that we can do, especially here, is to think about and talk about, well, what kinds of expressions of anger against Israel really are anti-Semitic? And I think that there are uh, good-hearted people who are honestly troubled by what happened in Gaza um, this summer and who maybe haven't thought about what are the implications of saying that the Israelis are Nazis? You know, why is that a problem? And I think that that's something that we can think about and help them to, to see. In a nutshell, in two minutes or less, um, I believe that anti-Semitism has to be never separated from intolerance in general. That intolerance is the genus, anti-Semitism is the species. And there are multiple forms. Uh, I would like to see more uh, scholarly teaching in this university on intolerance. Um, I think Jim Ponet uh, managed to teach uh, with Bo Bird a course on injustice in the law school, because lawyers should know something about injustice before they commit it. Well, I think, <laughs> I think intolerance, intolerance has the same uh, weight. Uh, and it is, it is a, ultimately a measure of the possibilities uh, of a democratic society. It, it, the level of tolerance or intolerance in that society can eviscerate its efforts uh, to be liberal. Uh, and putting anti-Semitism separated, keeping it separated from anti-Islam, anti-gay sentiment, uh, misogyny, uh, and in Europe in particular, anti-ethnic quarrels that exist all over the European continent, and not you know, just to start with the former Yugoslavia, but we can move in many directions. Hungary is a, is a good example of that, uh, where uh, the, um, the gypsy populations have been abused and maltreated in, this, in, 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 ta in tandem with the Jewish populations and murdered in the Holocaust as well. I see the danger in keeping anti-Semitism apart from the other forms of gross violations of human rights, and after all, the basis of the European experiment is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights written by a French Jew, René Cassin, in 1948, just at the moment when this Cold War got started. And when the Cold War collapsed, a great deal of the ethnic hatreds that were, were suppressed, as in the former Yugoslavia, became the basis for intolerance uh, uh, with which, around which, through which, Jews have suffered as well. And I, th I think the integration of anti-Semitism in our teaching here at Yale, which is not sufficient. I, I took a look at uh, the history offerings, one of the big departments. We don't have a single course on tolerance or intolerance. Uh, and uh, that is, is our failing, I think. We can do something here about this. Uh, and my friends in Paris, I know, have the same sense that the danger is reifying the Jewish question, as Marx did, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. separating it out, the Jewish question, as if it's not part of a much broader notion of what a liberal society should be in which Jews can happily rejoice in taking part. I, I don't really know what to do, so I, I don't have, <laughs> I think that, um, I think that the, one of the problems in, in Europe is that they have the state doing a lot of stuff instead of the civil society. That's just the European way of doing things, so the state has 
outlawed various expressions of uh, anti-Semitic behavior and uh, Holocaust denial, et cetera, et cetera. If you have, if you rely on the state mm -hmm. in that way, you, uh, in a way, are expressing the weakness of civil society. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions on hate speech there that we don't have here because in this kind of the way that the U.S. democracy has operated is say that we have to have a social structure that uh, demands people learn to respond to things they don't like through their own counter speech, through social movements and things like that. So obviously what has to happen in this context in Europe is for the emergence of more uh, public criticism, more engagement by the civil society, by intellectuals, by social movements, by trade unions. Um, and this is all I can see that would need to be happening. I don't know what, what can be done to make that happen. Well, one of the things we can do at this point is turn it over to the audience. I have only three cards. I thought I'd be inundated with cards, but let me, you, if you do have a card, raise it and the staff will pick it up. And I'm going to start with the first question, and I'm going to address this to the whole group and whoever likes, not all four have to comment, but whoever would like to can. The question is, do you see a correlation between Israel's actions and anti-Semitism? Do you think the, I can't read this. The drawing of such a correlation is anti-Semitic. Um, do I see a correlation? I think that when there are events in the Middle East, it again, using Jeffrey's term, the, the lid is let off of something that is there. Um, and, and then there's an up, uptick. But I think you're also seeing a very uh, a distinct phenomenon of almost uh, what a, a scholar, um, Israeli scholar who taught at Georgetown for many years, Sarah Feinberg, calls the Israelization of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And it's almost, it's, it's an ironic reverse, because of course Zionism said that we'll have a Jewish state and that will make, normalize the Jewish people and then we'll be like everyone else and that'll do away uh, with anti-Semitism. Uh, there's a Hebrew phrase, lo dubim velo yar, there was no bear and there was no forest, but otherwise the story is true. You know, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a pipe dream, but of course it didn't happen. And what, you're ha what you have now, and I think you've heard it from people on the panel, um, is amongst the many other factors uh, that, that Israel becomes the foil for expression of anti-Semitism for many people. That's not to say, and again, to, to buttress what uh, I think Jeffrey had said earlier, um, that criticism of Israel is not ipso facto anti-Semitism. You want to read criticism of Israel, go to haaretz.com, and you can see criticism of Israel in the extreme. So criticism of Israel is not ipso facto uh, anti-Semitism. I think that's very important uh, to keep in mind. It's the obsession, it's the use of certain uh, imagery. Um, it's sort of, I think it was Justice Potter Stewart when he was talking about pornography, said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. I think so many of us in this room know it when we see it. But um, uh, so there's that connection there. Uh, but uh, to say simply that anti-Semitism is caused by Israel's actions is not only simplistic, but it comes as close as possible to blaming the victim. If someone were to say, and I say this in all due seriousness, if someone were to say, Michael Brown got shot on the streets of Ferguson uh, because young black men uh, hang around on the corners and wear their pants slouched down and they deal in drugs or whatever other stereotypes, false stereotypes you want to use, and, and if that hadn't happened, uh, he wouldn't have been shot. Or if someone else said, Yale women wouldn't, usually people who say this kind of thing would talk about Yale girls, but I'll say Yale women, wouldn't have a problem of what we call date rape, which is really understated, but we should just call it rape, um, if they didn't go to parties and wear uh, short skirts and, and revealing dresses and get drunk, uh, they wouldn't get raped. Well, maybe revealing dresses and getting drunk is not smart, but it doesn't give you anyone the right to rape you. 
um, you know, behavior of people who are in your ethnic group or your racial group doesn't give anyone the right to shoot you. Um, we wouldn't tolerate that. So to say that, that, that um, Israel actions what cause it is the best you can say about that is simplistic in the extreme. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, uh, you know, did, is there a correlation between uh, what's happening in the Middle East and anti-Semitism? Well, obviously there is. You know, the mobs in uh, Paris um, all are saying that they're doing that because of Gaza. But of course, there are deeper reasons. And I have news for the people who say that. There was anti-Semitism before the Gaza war. You know, I mean, that seems obvious. And it's also important to underscore, and this is what I think gets left out of that correlation. People who overemphasize that correlation are leaving out the fact that nothing Israel does justifies violence against Jews in Europe. So that has to be a fundamental axiom. And what, I, what bothers me is often the slippage, is that, uh, well, Israel is doing this, and if more people would just denounce Israel, then that would be, there would be an end to anti-Semitism. Well, that's blaming the victim, and it's also legitimating uh, I think, or implying that it's legitimate to have anti-Semitism as long as Israel is doing something or as long as American Jews aren't sufficiently denouncing uh, Israel's actions. So I think those are some of the problems with that easy analogy. I'm going to jump to, instead of everybody commenting on every question, I want to be sure that the people's voices get heard. So I'm going to jump to another question, which I'm really glad somebody wrote this in, because we focused a lot on Europe and on the Middle East, and somebody has asked it a question about America. So I'm going to read this. It's a little bit long. What about recent incidents in the US where teachers have assigned work that is clearly anti-Semitic? For example, debate if the Holocaust happened, or compare Bush with Hitler. Are Americans sufficiently outraged? Are teachers, therefore, schools testing the waters here in the United States? The incident, I think, that the person is asking about is the Rialto School District, and I, I wrote about that in Tablet in, in May, uh, where in a uh, district-wide question uh, as part of the critical thinking uh, curriculum, um, a group of teachers gave a question. I don't have the exact text in front of me, but you can Google Rialto uh, School District Holocaust. You'll, it'll come up, um, where eighth grade students were asked to uh, decide, the, the question began, sometimes when tragedies, uh, people will, will exaggerate tragedies because of profit and, and political use or something like that, and uh, you have read the Diary of Anne Frank, now uh, can you d debate whether the Holocaust happened or not? And they were given three sources to go to. Um, History.com, <laughs> Answers.com, and christianbeliefs.com, or some sort of something like that, it was a, is, a, is a Holocaust denial site. Um, and the students were asked uh, to, to, to give this, you know, to, to deal with this. First of all, the question is ludicrous, uh, the sources more so. Um, but what also was shocking is the, uh, the assignment was given out, and it took about two or three weeks for any parent to complain to the school board, and then somebody took it to the ADL. And the ADL investigated immediately, as it should, and um, the ADL is not shy about calling people anti-Semites when they think they're anti-Semites. So when they said these teachers weren't anti-Semitic, you, you took it seriously. So then you had to ask, what was happening here? Well, the school board initially defended the teachers and said, no, this is um, critical thinking and students have to ask tough questions. Well, part of the problem is you know, that, that sometimes your, bra your mind is so open, your brains fall out. Um, <laughs> you know, that's not my, I don't know who originally said that. I wish I did, because they deserve credit for that wonderful observation. Um, but the school board said, no, we have to keep an open mind about things. And there's no, not two sides 
to history issues of whether they happened or not. There's not two sides to whether World War I happened or not, as Jay can tell us and everybody in this room should know. Not two sides whether the Holocaust happened or not. You might debate, there are serious debates about the why it happened, how it came about, uh, whether it was elite, would it come from the top, come from the, all sorts of things. Um, so uh, then the school board, when it began to be inundated, uh, said, again, not showing their stellar thinking, that they were giving all the teachers sensitivity training. Um, and you know, I wrote in, in, a, in a piece in Tablet that they didn't need sensitivity training, they needed history lessons. You know, um, so I think it's just, it's this sense of uh, this, this, this uh, a lack of critical thinking on the part of the teachers, a lack of, um, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, 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 mushing, I know that's not a very uh, serious academic word, but I can't think of a better one right now, of all sorts of bad things, and let's debate. Everything can debate. There are two sides to, to every question. It's, it's the immoral equivalencies. Um, and I think that that showed intense ignorance, um, and, and, and it wasn't like there was a closet anti-Semite or closet Holocaust denier there. Um, on this second question of you know Bush, Bush equals Hitler, um, no matter what you think about George W. Bush and uh, his policies and the legacy of those policies, that kind of analogy is is ludicrous. It's, it's just ludicrous. Um, and it's you know maybe it's at this point though, so I can get it in um, because again it's, it's it's something that was reported. But what I said, I. I um, I agree with uh, Maury. I think you just talked about the um, laws against Holocaust denial. I, I'm against laws against Holocaust denial. Um, I don't think they're efficacious. Um, I think they turn the Holocaust into forbidden fruit. They make it very attractive. Well, why are they denying this? It also suggests that we don't have the historical evidence to prove what happened. Um, that. How, uh, that's different from hate, sp uh, from um, uh, uh, incitement, speech of incitement. I also think laws against hate speech are very, very uh, difficult, and very it's very difficult to to sort of pin them down, etc. But I also think that that analogies, um, and and this needs to be said. So I'm going to grab this opportunity to say it. I go home tomorrow, so it's you know. Um, but the analogies to both 19, Europe today, 1939, are completely wrong. Uh, in 1939, you didn't have the president of France, you didn't have the chancellor of Germany, uh, and, and many other, or the, or the prime minister of, of England speaking out against this. It's regrettable that you need the heads of state to speak out, but, but you have it. Um, and it's wrong, but the, the instrumentalization of the Holocaust, and Holocaust analogies, whether they come from uh, Jews, Israelis, or they come from those who are opposed to Israel's policies, opposed to the Gaza War, Palestinians, whatever, to talk about um, you know, the, the intent of this is, a, this is a Holocaust against Israel, I think is simply wrong. The fact that you have an army ready, ready makes the analogy wrong. Um, at the same time, it's equally wrong to talk about a genocide of the Palestinians. You can oppose Israel's policies, every aspect of their policies, vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, but to talk about a genocide um, is, is, again, a mis, uh, it's an instrumentalization of uh, the Holocaust. It's a misread, a misconstruing of what happen what's happening today and what's happen what happened in the 30s and the 40s. <laughs> That's not to say you can't disagree and think that they're completely wrong. But those kind of analogies, they don't, they don't further the conversation either. They s become a smokescreen, and I think uh, uh, it, that's very important to keep in mind. So, I see Jay wiggling, uh, yes. No, not really. I'm, I never disagree uh, with you, Deborah. of course. Oh, you can. <laughs> Friends over 40 years. You're right. Longer, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in favor of the use of uh, legislative and political rhetoric uh, to declare what is outside the limits of tolerance, and European countries do it through their legislatures. The best example I can give you 
is the uh, French uh, Chamber of Deputies um, declaring its support for those who believe that the murder of one million Armenians was genocide. Mm -hmm. They need it. The, the, right now, the Turkish population is in the middle of a major argument about this, stimulated, by the way, by the Syrian civil war, which has turned Turkish politics around in some important ways. These statements are rhetoric. Of course they are. They're symbolic, uh, but they matter. Uh, and, they, and, they, and they deal with something that I think is, is really critical and brings us back to America. When you know, I grew up in the 50s, I know what intolerance was. It was Joe McCarthy. I, I knew what it was all about. You know, an awful lot of Jews got uh, brought into that net, and, and a lot of them were communists at the time, including the Rosenbergs. The, the important point is we have nothing to, I think, boast about in terms of the history of persecuting those who are deemed our enemies, and that includes post 9-11. I think the way in which Islam has been dragged through the dust, sometimes by the people who use Islam or, uh, to further violent ends that have nothing to do with Islam, but the way that it's been dragged through the dust by the United States government under George W. Bush has levels of intolerance on it that are up there. I wouldn't use the, the, the German analogy at all. Uh, I'd use American analogies. I'd talk about Jim Crow. I'd talk about the levels of hatred that were there too. And the, the question is, what happens to an Islamic society that feels that it's turned into the enemy, whatever they, whatever they happen to say or do? Uh, and I think one of the consequences uh, of the criminalization of Muslims after 9-11 uh, is the spin-off of a second generation of young people into violence. So we, it's, in no sense is this a justification, but it's an explanation mm -hmm. of how these young people turn away from their from assimilation towards what Mary Douglas called the enclave society. They're just, uh, uh, you know, they're like the satmer, Hasidim. You know, they're they're living elsewhere, but also some somehow adjacent uh, to their own society. We we I think uh, cannot claim that the United States is a, a beacon unto the nations on the question of tolerance and intolerance, and it's gotten worse since 9-11. Maybe it was inevitable. I'm not sure what you think, uh, Jeffrey, that the, that the national emergency was such that exaggerated steps were inevitable. They had to happen. And I'm not talking about waterboarding. Uh, I'm talking about the stereotyping of Muslims um, as dangers to the United States. And I, I, I believe that that's something we can do something about, and we need to do something about. As long as we don't say that anti-Semitism is separate from other forms of intolerance. Mm -hmm. We have a question here. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, anti-Semitism became institutionalized. Anti-Semites created organizations and political parties. Anti-Semitism anti also infected political parties and secondary association. Is that kind of institutionalization occurring today? Well, I mean, the, right, the new right movements, the extreme right movements in Europe are not anti-Semitic movements. So in fact, they're, even though they were anti-Semitic, right. their main mobilizing okay. issue is anti-Muslim very explicitly. In fact, the French National Front has suppressed its anti-Semitism, is making every effort to welcome the leaders, welcome Jews, are, they, they even like Israel. But the masses in this organization are less, are not very teachable on, on anti-Semitic issues and have made public statements. But so, I mean, I, I'm just, we have to keep some perspective on this, that the, the new right, the danger to me in Europe is the new right, which is mostly organized around anti Islamic, but this group is also, I think, anti-Semitic too. And this can be, the lid is being lifted. And it's a very, as European democracies are being destabilized, as anti-democratic and primordial groups are gaining power, that's, that's, that's a great danger of, for Jews, but for a lot of other people. And, and there's an irony to it, as you say, that many Jews, some Jews, I don't, I have no idea how many, some Jews are attracted to those movements because they seem to be speaking out against the sources of much of the overt anti-Semitism. But um, 
uh, you know, so suddenly uh, a Le Pen who for years was built on anti-Semitism and even close to Holocaust denial, uh, the, the, the next generation is, is trying to welcome, welcome Jews. And there, it reminds me of a statement in the book of Proverbs, Lomi duvsheich v'lomi uktseich, to the bee. I don't want your honey and I don't want your sting. You know, it's the, the philo-Semitism turns into the anti-Semitism very, very easily. Yeah, I would just say, you know, so far, they've been, uh, you know, small, but there are there is an anti-Zionist party in France, which is on its surface crazy. Why, you know, why should that issue have, be a political party in France? It gets a very small percentage of the vote, unlike the the National Front, which gets in the polls in the twenty percent. You know, so but those there it does exist. You know, but right now in in a kind of small institutional way. One, one possible point is to say that there is a large group of people who want to say no to everything, and everything includes Israel. Mm -hmm. and Israel is, uh, a, is a, a power uh, and much, much more uh, able to defend itself, obviously, than any of the other countries in, in the vicinity. Uh, so the, if you can imagine that European politics has always had a large number of people say no to whatever the establishment says. And for 50 years, they were communists. They just said no. They didn't want the European Union. They, didn't, they just didn't want, period. Now, where do they go? What happens to these former people on the left? The city of Amiens that I know pretty well on the Western Front and all this, it was a communist city for 50 years. And now it's Popular Front. And it's the same people, by the way. It's not... Uh, it's not that they've had a, a demographic displacement. It's the people who are against, no matter what it is you happen to, you happen to put forward. I, I find that, that that group of naysayers, maybe because the Communist Party in the United States uh, was never a serious political force, uh, the, the great naysayers in this country was the South. And they got their comeuppance, found another way to deal with, uh, uh, with their uh, special way of, of life. Uh, but in Europe now, there's a very large population, uh, what I would call, of uh, floating naysayers who find in anti-Semitism a way to annoy the hell out of people like us. Because, because precisely, it is offensive. That's what they want. They want to offend. Uh, you know, a very good example of this. I spent a lot of time, I, my first job was in Jerusalem, persuading uh, Ze'ev Stanhal, who's a great figure in political science in Israel, that he's wrong in trying to uh, ban Céline's Voyage au bout de la nuit, uh, Journey to the End of the Night, which is an anti-Semitic diatribe and a work of genius. But it, 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 it hasn't been published in Israel. It's not allowed uh, to be published in Israel, at least so far. Uh, and in my view is you've got to understand that Céline really spoke for a large number of people who simply hated everybody, you and me. And a large number of anti-Semites hate everybody. Uh, we're, we happen to be in the front probably because the the newspapers and the social media put... And 2,000 years of history. Then. <laughs> yeah, well, more, more or less. But I think we should not underestimate how easy a target we are. That's right. And, and that's, that's part of the danger. That's why I'm glad that you raised this voice of, of, uh, of worry uh, that, that needs to be addressed. We'll bring this now from, uh, from France right to this very room. The next question is, looking around the room, there are comparatively few undergraduates here. Given that the Holocaust doesn't resonate as a central touchstone of Jewish identity for the current generation of college students, how can we or should we even try to instill a sense of urgency about anti-Semitism, particularly since college students do take significant action against other forms of prejudice? I mean, I do see some undergraduates, including some who were in my class on representing the Holocaust. I see uh, several. So I, I think that, you know. A few yeah. in the balcony, but I think if you look around, they're relatively a small number. Mm -hmm. this, this is dinner time. <laughs> First comes food, and then comes morality, Brett put it. That's right. articulate what a lot of people were thinking um, and happened to find a place for it on the, on the pages of the New York Times and it stirred up uh, a lot of conversation. 
I want to almost be my own devil's advocate. That way I'm always right, you know, so it's great to see I think at the same time that there's what to worry about, uh, the Jewish societies in Europe being afraid to go places, and the bigger picture has been emphasized by so many, but everyone on this panel, uh, the continuing weakening of liberal, democratic, multicultural, multifaceted European, and not just European society, but particularly European society. Those are very real concerns and very real worries. But I think at the same time, um, if I were to give a message to undergraduates, speaking to them as Jew to Jew, the Jewish undergraduates here, I don't know that the first message I would give them is the urgency of anti-Semitism. I would give them a message, you know, that's almost saying to them, you have to be Jewish because everybody hates the Jews. Or you have to be Jewish because Jews are in danger. And I think the word should be, at first I don't think everybody hates the Jews, but a lot maybe, but not, not a lot. <laughs> but um, I think it's not because it's despite. Be concerned, uh, be Jewish, identify Jewishly, embrace your tradition, not because of hostility, not because of the negative, uh, but despite that negative, because there's so much richness, which is portrayed in this building and taught in this building, taught by colleagues and, and, and here at this university, my own, so many places, um, because of all the, the, the richness and the, the tradition and the, the wonders of the tradition, and, and at the same time be concerned about those who might be negative, but never let that negative be turned into the raison d'etre for your um, identity. First of all, that's giving the oppressor power over your identity. You know, if women were to say, I only feel strong as a woman, celebrate my feminist identity and feminist heritage and all that, when there's sexism, or if African Americans would only say, would say oh, well, the only time I feel strong is African American when I run into racism, you're, you're, you're discounting a, a, a terrific and wonderful traditions and cultures, um, and it becomes a very negative kind of mm -hmm. thing. So at the same time that I think it calls for vigilance, it calls for awareness, um, I, I, don't want, I don't know that urgency is the right word. I think it calls for, for yes, to be, as I said, just more vigilant, but at the same time, not to make that the center point, the crux, uh, the baton over which you, had, you hit people on the head and say, uh, this is the reason let, let me dis differ with either one of your identities there, the devil's advocate or the real one. Uh, I spent most of my life in England uh, teaching there for years, decades. And I think the people who are, as it were, vulnerable are what I would call non-Jewish Jews. People who are Jewish but without a major identity. And if you will, uh, Deborah, the, uh, I, I admire deeply the phrase of the great historian Mark Bloch, who says that he only draws attention to his Judaism in the presence of an anti-Semite. Because he was French, he was Republican, he was Jewish as well, but he didn't speak about it except in the presence of an anti-Semite. Anti and most of the people whom I taught with at Cambridge for years who were Jewish were secular Jews, Jews who were, well, shall we say, lightly connected to their tradition. And, you know, after, I think, I'm not sure if I have the statistics right. This is the majority of our population. The Jewish people is made up of a large number of non-Jewish Jews, um, uh, spinning off into intermarriage and so on. And we, we know some of those problems. Now, how does anti-Semitism affect people who have self-conscious identities as Jews? I think speak to the people in this room. But many of the students whom I teach are Jews light. They have an identity which is made up I don't know, a little bit. And I, I, I think the anti-Semitic problem is with that population. How should they handle something that they don't really want to identify with very much at all? Mm -hmm. uh, for, for us, for someone who you know, b believes in, uh, uh, in, and is proud and to wear a Jewish identity publicly, like a kippah or whatever, have a mezuzah on your door as we have in Paris, uh, that's not a problem. Uh, the mm -hmm. problem, I think, is with the millions of people who may withdraw even that's further right. from right. Jewish identity 
uh, because of anti-Semitism, and, and that seems to me to be an urgent matter because it's about the young, it's about the future. Yeah, well, I mean, could go I, go ahead, I mean, historically, anti-Semitism has produced more intense Jewish identity. I'm not, and a lot of people have said that that's what sustained intense identity, and one of the problems in the United States that, of course, people have been talked about since the 60s is that the lessening of public anti-Semitism and the rise of intermarriage causes a crisis for American Judaism in terms of you have, now you want to be, you have to be observant by choice, you have to identify by choice, not, it's not in this, uh, forced on you by the hostility to simple Jewishness. So I mean, I, I think that American Jews don't experience anti-Semitism in their daily lives here so they are not interested, they are not interested in this topic. Americans don't care about <coughs> Europeans, whether they're Jewish or not. They never have. It's a very separated country. On the other hand, in the history of Judaism, one of the reasons why we have survived is there's a tremendous <coughs> transnational solidarity. And I think that is why we're here now. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, that will, be a, a tremendous source if this crisis worsens. Well, yeah, but again, I don't know which side of me is agreeing or disagreeing with you, and that'll we'll work that out later over <laughs> liquor. Um, but what I'm really talking about is uh, Jewish institutions using this as a means of enhancing mm -hmm. identity. Uh, the way to enhance, it's longer, it's harder enhance identity by teaching how Jews lived and not how they died. Enhance identity by teaching about Jews as subject and not about Jews as object. Yes, Jews have been object. I spend my whole life, my professional career, uh, studying that, teaching about that, writing about that. Uh, but when I take off my academic hat and go into you know, my private lives or whatever, that's not why I'm identifying Jewishly, as you well know, and as I think the same is for you. So that's, that's more of what I'm talking. At this moment, when there is a sense of worry and there's a sense of crisis, it's too easy to take that, for institutions yeah. to take that as a shortcut, and that's what I would be talking about. Very good. Well, I think that's a wonderful segue to bring our evening to a close. We are sitting in a place right now, if you look around you, where we take uh, Deborah Lipstadt's charge and we live that every day here. We are sitting in a place that is devoted to the pluralistic expression of Jewish life on campus, be that Talmud study, be that yoga, be that prayer, be that social activism. This is a place that supports that. And those of you who've come this evening to learn more about what it means to be Jewish, how and what is happening in the world around us and how we can respond. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate the uh, Yale's program for the study of anti-Semitism partnering with us this evening. And I appreciate all of our panelists coming in, especially Deborah to come so far. So thank you so, so much.